to Psalm 115. It's going to be up on the screens, so if you haven't got your Bibles, don't worry. Just follow on the screens. Psalm 115 and verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the heathen say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have eye, mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone that trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Irvin, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. For you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Adam. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord for this, from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. It's great to be back here, isn't it? Been in, missing from church now for three and a half months. It's a long time we've not been here. It's been a time as well where many problems have come and there have been many issues. Many people have died. Many people have lost their jobs. People have been in hospital. Not a good time for the country. But it reminded me of a time nearly 3,000 years ago in Israel. A time when the children of Israel were going through three and a half years of drought. You went out into the field and you can see like on the pictures, you know, it's not corn he's picking up, it's dust because there is no soil to support any of the, the crops and the grass. The donkeys, the animals, some of them are going very thin, some of them are dying. It is not a good time to be there. So let's go back three and a half years, because as we go back three and a half years, we meet these two men. These two men, Abraham, no, Ahab, and Elijah. Ahab is the king in Israel. The capital is Jezreel. He's married to a lady called Jezebel. She's from Sidon. But of course, they worship different gods there. They worshipped the god called Baal and Ashtaroth. And as they worshipped these false gods, they came and they built temples for their gods and altars and statues and things. Elijah, he was a man who loved God. He was a man who wanted to tell people who God was. He was a prophet. God had told him how he ought to be living and how people ought to be. And he wanted to tell people about God. He comes and he says to, him, to Ahab today, there will be no more rain, there'll be no dew on the ground in the morning until I say so. And then he gets up and he walks out and leaves everyone around. I don't know what the people were thinking, but could you imagine someone coming into you saying those things? 
I think he'd be saying to yourselves, how can he control the weather? He can't. But of course, they've forgotten they're talking about his God, the God of Israel. For them, you see, the God who controlled the weather was Baal. He was the fertility God. He was the God who sent the rain and the dew in the morning. They'd forgotten all of that. And all they were doing was thinking about their God and what they wanted to do. Three and a half years, no rain, no dew on the ground in the morning. And of course, Ahab and all the other people are very, very concerned. Ahab knows what Elijah has said. He wants to meet him and he wants to tell him what he thinks about him. But it's not until those three and a half years are up that God says to Elijah, it's time to go and see him. And he does. And he meets them. And there he is. He's meeting up with Ahab. Now, of course, Ahab, he's got his own views of Elijah. He's a troublemaker. That's what he says as soon as he gets there. But of course, Elijah has to say something, you see. Because Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel, but it is you and your house. How has Ahab done it? Because they've taken the people away from worshipping the true God and they've now started to follow the gods of Baal. And that was what God was angry with. That's why God was punishing Israel for the things which they had done wrong. After he had said that, he says to him, I want you to get all the people together. Mount Carmel. I want you to bring your 450 prophets of Baal and I also want you to get 400 prophets of Ashtaroth and I want you to meet me there. Well, people were told and on the day there was thousands of people there. There was 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Ashtaroth, 850 false prophets. And there was poor old Elijah, all on his own. But of course, he wasn't on his own, because he was with God, and God was with him. And Elijah turns to the people, and he says to the people, How long will you falter between two opinions? You see, the people were thinking, I think I'll go to church on Sunday, but on Monday I'm going to go and worship this other God. And Elijah was saying, you can't do that. You've got to choose one God or the other to worship. You can't keep going and following two different gods on two different days. He says, if the Lord is God, then serve him. But if Baal, then serve him. Makes sense really, because if one of them is the true God, then of course, why would you want to serve them? So it is that uh, he goes on and he says to people, or to the prophets of Baal, he said, look, there's 850 of you there. Why don't you get two bullocks, bring them, and what we will do is you will build an altar, I'll build an altar, you put wood on yours, I'll put wood on mine, and when we're finished, we can kill the animals, put the animals on top. And then all we have to do is ask our gods. You ask Baal, and I will ask, you know, Jehovah, the God of the Bible. And whichever God answers, he will be the true God. And you can see everyone around thinking, do you know, that's great, that's true. Because if there is a God, he will be able to do something like that. Well, the prophets of Baal go first. And when the prophets of Baal, they build their altar, they put their wood on top, and then they start to get everything ready. And when it's ready, they start walking around and they start praying to their God. And they say to their God, 
and the fire. Well, the morning goes on. As the morning goes on, what happens? Well, the people start to say, nothing's happening. And the prophets of Baal are still doing it. But they're not going to give up. They're going to carry on. The morning comes, the afternoon comes, nothing. And then Elijah turns around and says to them, maybe your God's gone on holiday. Or maybe he's having a chat with somebody. Maybe he's fallen asleep. Now he's being a little bit sarcastic at this point because he wanted everyone to know that their God wasn't there. He was just a piece of wood or metal. He wasn't a God who could hear. Do you know, nothing happened. Elijah knew nothing would happen because their God wasn't real. You see, the idols which people make are silver and gold. They're the works of men's hands. And as we read in the Psalms, they have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, but they can't see. This is what was true about Baal. You see, Baal is not a true God at all. He's a false God. He's a God who doesn't exist. I think everyone was clear that day that their God, Baal, could not send fire. Well, it was Elijah's time. It was coming up to when the evening sacrifice used to take place in Israel. They hadn't really done it for a while. And the people turned around. When well, Elijah turned around and he saw where the altar had been. And he started to rebuild the altar. Twelve stones. Because of the twelve tribes of Israel. When he had built it, he put the wood on top. He had the animal killed and put the animal, the bull, on top. What then? Well, he did something different. He dug a ditch all the way around the outside of, the, of it. And he got water, loads of water, and it was poured over the top. Over and over again. So that, as you can see, the ditch around the, around the altar is full of water. The wood is soaking. Do you know there's no chance, even if he had hundreds and thousands of matches, whether you could ever light that. But then it wasn't going to be Elijah who was going to light it. It was going to be his God. And so it is that he comes out in front of everybody. He stands there. Now he could have just gone very quiet, bowed his head and prayed. But he didn't. You see, he wanted everybody to know that he was talking to God. He wanted everyone to know that it was God who is God who was going to do set the fire. He wanted everyone to know that he was God's servant. So what he was saying wasn't just coming from himself, but it was coming from God. And because it's coming from God, it's his word and they need to listen. When he had been, when he had finished praying, fire comes down from heaven. And you can see that there in that picture. It wasn't just animal, the bull, that was burnt up, or the wood, but it was also the stones and all the water in the pit around the trench had all burnt up and all the dust around. And everyone looked. Do you know, it was very clear to everyone there that this God who has done this was truly God. You know, he is the almighty God who done it. As we read earlier, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he chooses. There is nothing impossible with God. There is nothing that he can't do. Our God is great. Do you know what the people did when they'd finished? And he had when they'd seen all of this, they said these words. He, the Lord, he is God. They were talking about Jehovah. And all the people around were shouting it. The Lord, 
here's God. We can't do that today in church. But of course, if you sat at home watching on the video, you can. You can say, the Lord, he is God. He is. There is no one else. And then we come on to what happened to the prophets of Baal. You see, the prophets of Baal, they had been people who had been leading the children of Israel away from the true God. They were people who weren't really interested in the people. They were more interested in their God being worshipped. And of course, their God did awful things, you know, in their way in which they lived. There was, you know, sexual immorality going on, child sacrifice, all going on. And of course, when that's going on, God is angry with sin. And these people were leading the people to sin. And so they were taken, just as the law had said, and they were executed for all the wrong things which they had done. But of course, the day's not over. Elijah goes over and he speaks now. He speaks to Ahab and he says to Ahab, get something to eat, get something to drink, because the rain's on its way. Well, there's no sign of rain, but of course, Elijah now needs to pray to ask God to send it. And so there he is, he's bowing down to God and he's asking God to send the rain. And he prays. And then he calls his servant, he says, go up to the top of the mountain and look out and see if you can see the rain on its way. And his servant goes up and his servant looks nothing so he comes down now elijah doesn't go oh no god's let me down no elijah knows that god will keep his promises god has promised to him that he will send the rain so he prays again he's not going to give up and he sends up his servants once more and the servant gets up to the top of the mountain and he looks out it's a lovely clear day well that's what we might think. But they thought, you know, where's the vein? We want the vein. They were desperate for it. No vein. In fact, six times his servant went up the mountain after he had prayed. Six times. But Elijah knows that God answers prayer. And he prayed once more. And there he is, he's praying to God. And when he's finished, he sends his servant up again. He knows God will answer. His servant gets up there, and his servant looks, and there he is, the size of a man's fist, a little cloud in the distance. But that is all he needs, just a little cloud. And he says to Elijah, it's coming. And Elijah goes and he tells Herod, uh, Ahab to go, to go home because the rain will soon be here and it starts to go dark and it starts to pour and it starts to, you know, really get wet on the foot and it would be difficult travelling home and people would get soaked but I don't think they would be unhappy with that. Do you know, it's a great story but it's a true story. It's a story which tells us about the Lord. He is God. It's a story which tells us about prayer. You see, Elijah was a man of prayer. He prayed, knowing that God would answer his prayers. Sometimes God answers straight away, just like when he prayed for the fire, the fire came. Sometimes, like when with the rain, he had to continue to pray over and over again, praying that God's will would be done. Sometimes God lets us wait before he answers our prayers. And we've got to make sure that we continue to pray that God's will will be done here in the church, in the home, in our families, in the world. Of course, we know what God's will is for people to come to faith in Christ, for people to grow in grace and knowledge of him. And we need to be praying that this is what will happen. Do you know, our God is God. The Lord, the God of the Bible, 
is the true and living God. And we need to live our lives, not like the children of Israel were at the beginning, with, you know, I'll go to church on a Sunday, and maybe other times I'll live as if I'm not a Christian. We need to be living our lives always for his glory and his honour. Thank you. We're going to close in prayer now, so let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord God, that your word teaches us much. We thank you, Lord God, that the reminder that you are God and that there is no one else, that you are a God, Lord God, who, you know, will one day punish sin and a God yet, Lord God, as we know, has come and taken the punishment for our sin and we thank you for that. We pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to live our lives for your glory and for your honour. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people of prayer, people who call upon you to help us live in our lives and seeking your good and your glory.